Good day. This is the third lecture of session five from the respiratory module. My name is Dr. Majid Hamid Al Aboud, and I will talk about bronchial asthma, which we call it in Arabic Arabu Al Qasabi. So we have uh, six learning objectives that will be covered during this lecture. First, I will define asthma, and then I will describe the pathophysiology of asthma, and then the major precipitating factors for asthma, asthmatic attack. And then I will talk about the symptoms and signs of asthma. And uh, I will talk about the uh, tests that are used for assessing the condition uh, of bronchial asthma. And finally, I will talk uh, in a brief about the treatment of asthma. So asthma is defined as a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. So it is a chronic disease. In susceptible individual, the inflammatory symptoms are usually associated with widespread but variable air flow obstruction and an increase in airway responsiveness to a variety of stimuli. So it is very important to notice that in susceptible individuals, so not in each individual, not in each human being, there will be bronchial asthma. Only on those who are susceptible for bronchial asthma, and there will be inflammatory symptoms, and these inflammatory symptoms are widespread, Montessara, but they are variable, and there is variable airway obstruction. So some areas will be affected, some areas of the lung will not. And there is and increase in the airway responsiveness to a variety of stimuli that we will talk about in a minute. And usually the obstruction is reversible either spontaneously by itself without any intervention by us or is reversible with the treatment or drugs or medication. So there are five main characteristics of asthma. First, it is a chronic inflammatory process. And second, the susceptibility. So it occurs in people who are susceptible for asthma. And there is variable airflow obstruction. And there is airway hyperresponsiveness. And a very characteristic feature of asthma is the reversibility. Let's talk shortly about the burden of asthma. So it is estimated in the year 2012, it is estimated that the number of people with bronchial asthma was 300 million people worldwide. And only after five years from now, in the year 2025, this number is expected to increase to 400 million people. This is a very common disease. The prevalence of asthma is very high. Around 10% of all people worldwide will have asthma. It is more common in children, and it is estimated that 5% uh, of adults have a bronchial asthma. And by far, the most frequent chronic disease in childhood is a bronchial asthma. And we have to differentiate bronchial asthma from another obstructive lung disease called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD, which is a disease of people who are heavy smokers usually. So there is obstruction in both asthma but, and, and COPD, but what differentiate the two things, the two diseases are two characteristics. First of all is the reversibility. So as I said, asthma is reversible and characterized by reversible airway obstruction, either spontaneously or by treatment, while in COPD, the reversibility is not full. So it is not fully reversible. This is number one. Number two, the degree of improvement in the symptoms and in the test. So in asthma, usually there is a there is improvement in the condition by more than 15%, either spontaneously or by the use of what is called bronchodilators. 
drugs that dilate the bronchi, while in COPD, the improvement is usually minimum to less than 15%. The pathophysiology of asthma is not so complicated, and it is shown here in this figure. So whenever we are exposed to what is called allergen, and we have different types of allergens or stimuli that we will talk about later on, this allergen will be taken by the macrophage and will be processed by this macrophage and presented to the T helper 2 cells. And these T helper 2 cells will release cytokine, which will stimulate different types of cells like eosinophil, mast cells, and the neutrophil. And there will be release of many substances and chemical compounds or cytokines like the IgE and the histamine and other compounds. These cytokines from the eosinophil and the neutrophil, usually the B cells, will stimulate first of all the nerves, and this will result in hypertrophy of the and the spasm of the muscles, resulting in what is called the bronchospasm, muscles of the bronchi. And there will be leak of substances from the bronchi, uh, so, sorry, from the blood vessels, which will result in edema. And there will be vasodilatation of the arteries in the bronchi, and then there will be edema. And there will be a mucus hypersecretion and hyperplasia. And usually, asthma is allergic condition, and it is associated with other allergic conditions that are triggered by allergens, and we call these together atopic diseases. Example of atopic diseases that usually seen in people with bronchial asthma include allergic rhinitis, which is inflammation of the nose with the result of rhinorrhea sneezing, eczema, which is inflammation of the skin with itching, and scratching and etc. thickening of the skin and some food allergy. So all of these together are usually seen in people with allergic asthma. Why? Because a common thing for all of these atopic diseases is the increased level of eosinophil, IgE, and the nitric oxide. So whenever a patient or a susceptible individual exposed to antigen or allergen from the air usually, and we'll talk about these precipitating factors later on, there will be two types of responses. First of all, there will be immediate response, and this immediate response uh, occurs after 20 minutes from the uh, exposure to the antigen, and it is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction characterized by interaction between the allergen and the IgE that is produced from the B cells. This interaction will result in mast cell degranulation, degradation of the mast cells and release of the granules from the mast cells. And the cytokines from the mast cell degranulation will result in bronchoconstriction and the spasm of the bronchi and obstruction. This is the immediate. While the late response occurs later on after 3 to 12 hours from exposure to the antigen, and it is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, which results from reaction of all the following cells xenophils, mast cells, lymphocytes, and the neutrophils. All of these will accumulate together and release substances or chemicals. That's why we call it cellular reaction. These chemicals produced from all of these cells will result in airway inflammation, which will last longer. So, whenever we are exposed to an allergen, 
suppose we are asthmatic, we will have first of all type 1 reaction, which is the immediate response, and there will be dipping, as you can see here, in the peak flow meter, and the patient will feel short of a breath. This is followed by a few hours by the late reaction, which is not type 2 here, there is a typo error, it's type 4 reaction. And there will be recruitment of the inflammatory cells that I mentioned, activation of these cells, and it will last longer for many hours, up to 12 hours. So, airway inflammation is characterized by the following. There will be, first of all, epithelial shedding, shedding of the epithelial of the bronchi. And there will be smooth muscle contraction, which will result in a bronchospasm. And there, is, there will be mucus overproduction from the mucus cells. And therefore, a patient with asthma will have a lot of mucus. But this mucus is so thick that the patient cannot expel it out, cannot expectorate. And this might cause even some blood or obstruction to the bronchi. Again, airway inflammation is characterized by mucosal swelling and finally by bronchial wall thickening. All of these together will result in bronchial constriction and a shortness of the breath. In addition to that, the inflammation also causes hyperresponsiveness of the airways to non-specific stimuli. So at the beginning, we have specific allergens, but then later on, when there is inflammatory process, the bronchi will become more responsive to non-specific stimuli, and this will make this will make the thing more worse. And in people with long-term poorly controlled asthma, they might have some sort of airway remodeling. And by remodeling, me, we mean changing the shape and structure of the bronchi. Some of these features of remodeling may not be fully reversible. And these changes include, first of all, hypertrophy and hyperplasia of a smooth muscle. And there will be hypertrophy of the mucous glands. There will be more mucus secretion. And finally, there will be thickening of the basement membrane. So, as a result of the airway narrowing due to all the processes that I mentioned in the previous slides, we will have the following features. First of all, there will be wheezing. And by wheezing, we mean the, mucos, the musical sounds that we hear in people with bronchial asthma, like this. <laughs> So during expiration, usually patients with asthma will have wheeze. And also on respiratory function test, we will see an obstruction pattern on the spirometer, which is characterized by a ratio of FEV over FVC of less than 70%. And because the patient will be unable to exhale or to take the oxygen or the, uh, the, the air out of the lung, there will be trapping of air inside the lung because of this bronchial constriction, and this will result in increment in the, in the residual volume of the lung. In the next few slides, I will show you some of the pictures that will help. First of all, this is a real specimen at autopsy from a patient with a bronchial asthma. And you can see here in the red arrow a mucus. Here, this is a mucus in a large airway of a patient with, as with asthma causing obstruction of the airway. And here you can see the hypertrophied and the thickening of the muscle layer of the bronchi between these two arrows. So this is the muscle layer. Look at it, it's very hypertrophied and enlarged. And there will be thickening of the subepithelial basement membrane, as you can see here. And all the features is shown in this transverse section of the bronchus. So there is a lot of mucus stuck here and causing occlusion of the bronchus. And there will be 
uh, goblet cell metaplasia and hypertrophy of the goblet cell secreting in mucus and there will be inflammatory cell infiltration as you can see here different types of cells hypertrophy of the muscles of the bronchi and all of these will result in obstruction of the bronchus and air narrow and if we compare a bronchus of a normal healthy individual to that of a patient with a bronchial asthma you can see the uh, clearly the differences look at here it is very patent and the air goes in and out very easily but in a patient with asthma of first of all there will be mucus over protection production now the mucus usually is thick and full the airway second there will be hypertrophied muscles of the bronchi which will result in bronchoconstriction and you can see here there is edema of the airway wall, uh, which again add to the obstruction. And even inside the alveoli, there is filling of the alveoli by mucus, which will result in what is called ventilation, perfusion, mismatch. So what is the effect of airway obstruction on gas exchange? Airway narrowing will result in reduced ventilation in some areas of the lung while other areas of the lung are not affected in people with bronchial asthma usually. This will result in ventilation perfusion mismatch. So there is defect in the ventilation. The air is not going easily into the lung, but the blood flow is normal because the arteries, the major arteries of the respiratory system are not affected. Hyperventilation of a better ventilated areas but are not affected in people with asthma cannot compensate for the hypoxia and the low oxygen, but can compensate for CO2 retention by increased breathing out of CO2. As a result of that, we expect that in mild to moderate asthma, there is low PCO2 and low PO2, and this is characteristic of type 1 respiratory failure. While in more severe attacks, because there is extensive involvement of airways more areas of the lung are involved there is no sparing of any area in addition there will be exhaustion of the muscles of respiration patient will be exhausted and tired all of this will lead to a raise in the co2 it will be retention of co2 so the pco2 will be high po2 will be low and this is characteristic of type 2 respiratory failure therefore Whenever you see a patient when, with, with asthma and increasing PCO2, this is a very bad sign. And this is a sign of life-threatening asthma. The patient might die and you have to take action immediately. And usually the patient needs a transmission to the ICU, the intensive care unit, and assisted ventilation. So what are the major precipitating factors or allergens that we talked about earlier? First of all is the cold air. So people with asthma might have asthmatic attack when they expose to cold air. Second, they, uh, different types of allergens like pollen, animals hair and dander, house dust mite feces, there is a, a mite which is called house dust mite. We cannot see it by uh, the usual eyes, our eyes, only by microscope. And these usually live in the uh, in, 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 in our blankets, in our uh, pillows, in our uh, clothes. This, the feces of this house dust mite is a, a precipitating factor for us. Some people will have asthma when they exercise, and we call it exercise-induced asthma. Some people will have a bronchial asthma attack when they are exposed to emotional distress like extreme fear, extreme happiness, extreme sadness. Others will uh, have attack when they are exposed to fumes like car exhaust or cigarette smoke or perfumes. Others they have the attack when they are exposed to chemicals like uh, that chemicals are present in the varnish and paint, the isocyanates. And some people, they have asthma due to many steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like Voltaren and the Brofen. 
and beta blocker. So, so there are these drugs should be avoided in people with bronchial asthma. The symptoms of asthma are very characteristic. There is usually recurrent wheeze, and we talked about wheeze earlier, the, mu the musical sounds. Usually there is cough, and there is dyspnea and shortness of breath. The patient will feel chest tightness, and these symptoms usually triggered by precipitating factor that we talked about. On examination, starting with the general look on the patient, so probably you will find other signs of atopy like eczema or allergic rhinitis, and you should look at the ability of the patient to talk. In severe asthma, usually people cannot talk in sentences. They cannot talk in complete sentences. And sometimes we can see the signs of exhaustion in the patient and even cyanosis, which is bluish discoloration of the lips. On inspection of the chest, you may find chest deformities or signs of hyperinflation. And the signs of hyperinflation is what is called barrel chest. So the chest of the patient will, will be like a barrel, مثل البرميل. On percussion by the fingers, you will hear what is called increased resonance, and that is because of hyperinflation. And when you put your stethoscope on the chest of the patient, and by this we mean auscultation, there you will hear a prolonged expiratory phase. So the expiratory phase will be longer than the inspiratory phase. In addition to the characteristic polyphonic high-pitched noise wheezes, which is usually expiratory, not an inspiratory wheeze. What about the diagnosis? In addition to the sign and symptoms, we depend on lung function tests sometimes. So by spirometer, there is obstructive pattern. And there will be reduced peak expiratory flow and forced expiratory volume in the first second, which we call it FEV1. And again, there will be reduction in FEV1 over FVC ratio. And very characteristic of a spirometer is the reversibility that we talked about. In asthma, there is reversibility of the condition when we uh, introduce a bronchodilator or sometimes spontaneous. On peak flow meter, usually the patient will have either normal or low peak expiratory flow meter. But there is characteristic what is called morning dipping. And I will show you the meaning of morning dipping in the peak flow meter. And usually there is variability from one day to another. So there is variability in the same day between morning and night. And there is variability between one day to another day. And there is uh, what is called bronchial hyperresponsiveness, BHR. And this is by either induced by inhaled histamine, so we give histamine to the patient and we see the bronchospasm, or by asking the patient to exercise, and uh, by exercise the patient will have asthmatic attack. But these are dangerous tests but be cautious when you do it. So as you can see here, this is the reversibility test. The green line is the patient during an asthmatic attack before administration of a bronchodilator in the form of inhaler. After 20 minutes from the uh, bronchodilator, you can see the improvement in the uh, volume, uh, or the FEV1 and the uh, uh, the whole uh, spirometer. And this is the peak flow. So these are the days, Monday, Tuesday, etc. And we have here AM and PM, the, uh, the uh, morning and the night. So there is, as you can see here, first of all, there is variability between days. Like here, the best day was in Tuesday. Sorry, the best day was in Wednesday, while the worst day was in Tuesday. And there is changes between day and night. So usually there is what is called early morning dipping. Always in the early morning there is bronchospasm and the patient will tell you, I feel always short of a breath in the early morning 
And this is characteristic of a bronchial asthma. Now we will talk about the management of asthma. Overall, the, our goals for management of asthma, we can divide it into two things. First of all, we need to achieve the current base control. We need to control the current asthmatic attack by controlling the symptoms, by using the reliever or the inhalers, and to improve the activity of the patient and to improve the lung function. And second aim is to reduce the future risk of getting asthmatic attack by controlling the instability and the worsening, by reducing the exacerbations of the attacks, by improving the lung, lung function uh, loss, and by reducing the medication adverse effect. So in general, in asthma, we have inflammation and we have bronchospasm. These are the major things that we face in asthma. For inflammation, we can use inhaled corticosteroid, and I will show you the inhalers, what we call it in Arabic, bakhakh. We have inhaled the chromoline sodium. We have oral corticosteroids like prednisolone, and we have oral leukotriene antagonists such as Montelocast. While for the bronchospasm, we have the reversal or the immediate treatment of bronchospasm by the use of inhaled short-acting beta agonist, like inhaled salbutamol. And we have the long-acting to prevent the future bronchospasm, such as the long-acting inhaled beta agonist or inhaled chromoline or inhaled theophylline, etc. And this is the famous five steps of the management of asthma that you should know always. So whenever we come and encounter and we face a patient with asthma and we want to control asthma, first of all, we have to assess asthma. So if it is a mild intermittent asthma, we can start with step one, which is inhaled short-acting beta again. And then we follow up the patient after a while if he is well, we keep him on uh, inhaled short-acting beta agonist as required whenever he has the symptoms. But if the symptoms worsen, then we may jump to step two and we add inhaled the steroid. And then we jump to step three if there is no control of asthma. And then we jump to step four and finally to step five. And whenever the patient is controlled, we may Get, go back from step up to step down, from step five to step four to step three, according to the symptoms and the control of symptoms of the patient. So these are the five steps that I talked about. In step one, usually we start with a short-acting beta agonist like inhaled salbutamol on demand, which means whenever the patient needs it, not always, just at the time of shortness of breath. And then we have step two, we add, look at this plus, we add. So we add inhaled corticosteroid, and then if there is no control of asthma, we can add inhaled long-acting beta agonist, not short-acting. If there is no control, we may add long-acting muscarinic antagonist like thiotropium, and the final step, when all of these steps fail, we may add uh, uh, oral corticosteroids like a prednisolone tablet. This is the typical inhaler or bakhakh. And you should know how to use the inhaler because you are going to educate your patient on the use of inhaler. First of all, you should remove this part, which is the cap, and shake the inhaler well, so the substance inside the inhaler, inside this canister, will be mixed. And then you ask the patient to breathe out gently and to place this mouthpiece into the mouth. And then incline the head backwards to minimize the oropharyngeal deposition of the substance. And then you ask the patient to 
start a slow breathing inspiration at the same time depress the canister by his finger down so the inhaled material will get out from this part into the mouth of the patient and he should hold the breath for 10 seconds to keep the, um, the material or the drug inside the lung to the maximum time possible. So this is called method dose inhaler and by method dose uh, we mean it gives a, a, a specified amount of the drug a measured amount of the drug, a measured dose of the drug with each puff or with, with each inhalation. Again, this is another type of method dose inhaler, and this is what is called the dry powder inhaler, which is different here. There is nothing to push, there is no canister, but there, there is a tablet inside here will be crushed to form a powder, and the patient will inhale the powder from this opening into the mouth and into the lung. This figure shows you the pharmacokinetics of inhaled corticosteroid. So this is the method dose inhaler that contains the inhaled corticosteroid. When the patient push this down, the steroid will go into the lung, but unfortunately only 10 to 20 percent will go to the lung. The rest of the amount that is 80 to 90 percent will be swallowed and go to the gastrointestinal tract. This is swallowed corticosteroid will be absorbed into the blood and go to the liver. And in the liver it will go the first pass metabolism and inactivation and some of it will go back into the systemic circulation and this will result in side effects. While we need to increase the amount of inhaled steroid into the lung and to reduce this amount in order to reduce systemic side effects. And this is the final slide of this lecture. So how do we treat acute attacks of asthma? When the patient comes to us with acute attack of asthma, first of all, we have to give what is called nebulized beta-2 agonist like salbutamol or epratropium, which is uh, anticholinergic, delivered in the oxygen, okay, by the nebulizer. And this is the nebulizer. And I assume that you have seen this in the emergency room. So this is a nebulizer, and usually we put the substance here, the uh, beta agonist or the epratropium, and this is attached to the electricity and uh, uh, and, uh, and then you can, the, the patient, this is the mat that we put on the face of the patient and he will breathe the nebulized beta agonist through this instrument, which is called nebulizer. Then we should give intravenous steroids like hydrocortisone in the IV, intravenously. And then we could give short course of high dose oral prednisolone Sometimes, in severe cases, we may need other drugs like magnesium sulfate and aminophylline given intravenously through intravenous infusion. And as I said, in life-threatening asthma, when there is respiratory failure type 2, the patient might require admission to the intensive care unit with assisted ventilation. And thank you for listening to